thank you so much for joining us to learn about our new embedded identity features for third-party experience cloud apps. My name is Sam, I'm joined by Divot, and we're both product managers for Salesforce Identity. We're really excited to have you here today. So, let's start with that forward-looking statement. It's a slide that I'm sure everyone in this audience has seen presented a million different times. Now, when we think about the forward-looking statement, it really is pretty simple. Don't make any purchasing decisions based on things that you can't touch, feel, and configure within the application. Good news, everything we're gonna talk about today, we've actually already shipped. So there are a few features coming with winter, but everything else was shipped in summer and spring, so you should be good to go. But keep that in mind. So let's move forward. So Dana and I are both part of the identity fam, and we have a set of features that we call Salesforce Customer Identity. Salesforce Customer Identity is about allowing you to bring your digital experiences into Customer 360, your registration experience, your login experience. And it actually comes for free with every experience cloud and community license. And when you're using our features, you can also use them with the license that we call the external identity license. What's the goal of our feature set? It really is to make sure that whether you're interacting with people through marketing cloud, through your sales channels and sales cloud, through service cloud, well, what about your digital channels? What about your websites? What about your registered users? And how do you offer a common set of identity features through all of your platforms and all your applications so that you can commonly identify who you're talking to, what they care about, and that you can deliver the right customer experience for them. Now, traditionally, we've always delivered those experiences using headful experiences. So think about OAuth redirect flows. You click log in, you're redirected to a login experience, or you're redirected to a registration experience. But we have a set of customers, especially in the B2C space, who say, wait, we want pixel perfect control. We don't want to redirect from our mobile app to a web view. We don't want to redirect from our web app to a common IDP sign-in page. And for that, we've been working for the last year to deliver a full suite of headless capabilities for the Salesforce platform specifically to solve those use cases. Now, somewhere in the audience, I'm gonna guess that there's probably roughly three groups of people. There's someone who understands what in the world I'm talking about and are going, great, I wanna learn more. There is another group of people who are going, okay, cool, this sounds interesting, but I don't actually think I know what you mean. What is headless versus headful? And there's a third group who are going, dear God, Salesforce, what are you doing? Um, why aren't you doing open standards? Why are we talking about headless? That's not the way we do it. That third group of people, give me time. For the second group of people though, I wanna describe what we're really talking about. So if we think about traditional headful and redirect based identity experience, we might start on fixcoffee.com. And when our user clicks log in, we're gonna redirect them to maybe something like identity.fixcoffee.com, which is your identity provider. And that's where you're gonna do your login and registration experience. If you're using Salesforce as your identity provider, that's really Experience Cloud in the background driving that. Now, you can brand and customize Experience Cloud to make sure that that experience isn't jarring, but that takes time and it takes energy. It requires your developers to understand how to build that in Experience Cloud. It requires you to keep your brand assets in sync. And there's just some extra work that you have to do to make that work. And there are lots of good reasons to do that extra work. Shared infrastructure, shared experience, shared platform. But there's another way we can do this, and it's a way that many of our customers want to. What about embedded identity? So this is what we refer to as headless identity. The idea here is that when I press login, the developers on fixcoffee.com decide what happens next. They pop a modal, they grab a web view, they do something interesting in that space, or they keep you native entirely within the application. It's entirely up to your control. The developer stays in their stack. The user never leaves their website. The user enters their credentials on the website. And in the back end, we communicate with our new headless identity APIs and the user is logged in seamlessly. That's what headless identity is. And that's how it compares versus a standard redirect based identity. Now to deliver headless identity for an application in a complete way, you actually have to complete the whole journey. And that's what we've done actually over the last three releases. We have a headless registration flow that signs your user up, verifies their email or SMS, and leaves them logged into the application without ever redirecting them. We have username and password login. We have passwordless login. We have forgot password. You can run the entire identity journey in a completely headless manner. Sorry about that, guys. Um, with that full set of headless capabilities, 
we made sure that we based it. Apparently, I'm fighting with my own slides. Um, with that full set of headless capabilities, we also based it on open standards. So even though they are proprietary, your developers will be able to look at um, the patterns, the flows, the code, and they'll understand what this is because it's based off of the open standards. And we'll talk about that shortly as well. And then we really worked hard to create best-in-class documentation. So our documentation, candidly, on Salesforce Identity side is not good enough. And we do know that, and we're working towards it. But we wanted to take extra time and make sure that this was right. So what you'll notice if you look at our headless documentation, you have opinionated docs with diagrams, with what you should do if you're a private or public client, with security recommendations, with code samples, because we've actually implemented our, this ourselves in the background to make sure it works and it works the way we expect it to. And we'll talk more about all the docs that we built as well. Now, we've talked about this. You've heard me talk for a while. I've blown yours off a few times. I get it. Um, what we're going to do is we're actually going to show you a demo of this all working. And while Daivat is going to show us our demo in a second, and he's much braver than I am because live demos really just make me sweat through my shirt. We don't need to see that. I'm just going to tell you real quickly what we're going to see. So what we're going to see is a Heroku application that I've spun up, and it's essentially a single-page JavaScript application. It's using a Nginx server that's serving a PHP page that is very literally running JavaScript in the browser. There is no communication to the backing web server. And it's running on a Heroku domain, I think it's Fix Coffee or Headless Identity Demo .heroku -app com. And in the background, that's connecting to a Salesforce org where we're using it. Uh, we're using our new Headless Identity APIs, which are sitting on top of Experience Cloud, and then, of course, sitting on top of Salesforce Platform. So, Daivat, I think we should show them maybe registration. What do you think? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, let me switch over to the demo environment that Sam just mentioned. What I'm going to do is hit sign up over here. Uh, this is the sign up form, and as you can see, it's already uh, showing up within the the page, not on a, as a redirect. I'm going to paste in my password, and if you see very closely, we have two verification options. One of them is verify with email, the other one is SMS, and I want to keep want you guys to keep this in mind as I move forward. I'm going to check this checkbox that I agree to the terms of service, and I hit next. So I'm assuming the demo gods are going to be happy with us, and boom. Uh, I get a prompt to verify my email. So I'm going to get a code in my email that I'm going to put it right here. And I hit verify. So at this point, the account should be signed up. And if you see over here, I have the email address that I just mentioned and uh, I'm good to go. So let's talk really quick about what happened behind the scenes. So when I hit submit on the sign up form, we basically send that via the registration initialization endpoint to the identity APIs. But at this point, we did not sign up the user just yet. We did have it on Salesforce, but the reason we did not do it is because we have not verified the user. So the other reason we also did this is because we do not want to use up your valuable licenses because we don't want someone to be hitting the identity APIs to be able to keep using the licenses that are pretty pricey and uh, used for uh, only verified users. So what we do instead is we actually send out the verification code and we actually don't use a link in this process. We use a code and you might be wondering why. We have always been traditionally using a link, but now we use code. So the reason for this is because we actually do not know where this application is hosted. It could be a web application like we have over here. It could be a device or it could be a mobile app. But we do not want to make any assumptions and we want you to control the entire experience. And as a result, we send out a code so the user has to verify via email or SMS. And once they enter the code, we send the, the code that was entered plus the initial identifier back over to the identity APIs. And at that point, the user gets created. So the important thing to note over here is we did not use up a user license until the user did two things. They completed the sign up as well as they made sure that they verify their user, uh, their email address or their phone number. So at this point, what we do is um, we send back the authorization code back to the application. The application exchanges that with an exchange token, and boom, the, the user is logged in. So this is the login flow. Uh, I'm going to show you real quick. Uh, sorry, this was a registration flow. I was, I'm going to show you real quick how the login flow looks like as well. So let me log out over here. I'm going to hit login again on the app that Sam built. Going to 
enter my username and password and hit login. So again, it is a very simple process, but what, ha what happened behind the scenes? Let's take a quick look. All right, so uh, what happened is when I entered the username and password and I hit login, we basically base64 encoded this and sent it via the authorization basic header. This flow is very similar now uh, to the web server code flow. And at this point, what the identity APIs will do is verify the details and then send back the authorization code. At this point on, the flow is exactly similar to what the registration flow looked like in the past. And the, the application takes this and exchanges the authorization code with an access token and logs in the user. So I'll pass it back to Sam. Awesome. Thanks, Saivat. So all of this is based on actually the open standard sale, uh, web server code flow, which is what Salesforce calls it. But in the auth world, that's referred to as the authorization code flow. What we did was we took that base flow and we made a few modifications because we need to make it work in a headless world. You, you didn't see any redirects. It's not because we were doing anything strange. We really don't do any redirects. All those calls were made via Ajax. So how did we do that? Well, we created the Salesforce authorization code and credential flow. It's our proprietary modified version of this. What we do, we made the authorization endpoint load in cores. So you could actually make those calls via Ajax. And we made it accept authorization headers. So you could send a username or password or potentially a request identifier, like maybe a reg registration request identifier and an OTP. We try and use the same patterns as much as we can. You can also put these things, by the way, in the post body if you don't want to set them in headers. And in the future, we have plans to allow you to actually encrypt these values as well and have a shared encryption key between the server and the and Salesforce, assuming that they can keep secrets. When we built this, it was really important to me that we built it in a way that you built that you, from a development perspective, wrote one section of code that basically defined the overarching pattern. And then after you do that, you can easily extend it to support our new features. So once you build the core flow, it is very literally between five and 10 lines of code to add registration, username, password, password lists, and what we're calling the guest user flow, which is a whole new feature that actually allows us to mint a guest jot out to your application with an embedded identifier within it. So you can actually uniquely identify guest users and you can see them when they return and reinstantiate their guest session. What you do with that is entirely up to you. You choose the identifier. We just mint it into a token so that you have proof that it exists. Key thing here though, is write your core code for this all this headless work once, and that's in that central piece, the authorization code and credential flow. And then it's about 10 lines of code to add registration or any of these other pieces. And I'm not saying that anecdotally. I wrote the underlying library that runs that app. It really is 10 lines of code at most, and oftentimes it's about three. So we really worked hard on this. Now, I want you to learn more, and I told you we spent a lot of time on documentation. So the first thing we did was we built an implementation guide. It's gonna take you from signing up a brand new developer org all the way through configuring all of these features and then testing them with the Salesforce Postman API collection, which has all the new headless flows built into that collection already. So check that out. It'll take you zero to hero and really show you how to configure your org and get it in good shape. We also launched a trailhead module. And this actually came out, I think, Thursday of last week. And it's the Headless Identity Basics Trailhead module. It's one of two. This one really focuses on what is our feature set? How does it work? Why does it work? And where should you use it and where shouldn't you use it? We're going to have another module that comes out later this year. And what it's going to do is it's going to actually give you hands-on challenges. Configure your entire org. And then connect a demo application very similar to what Divot showed you where you will actually be able to test out and demonstrate to your business partners what Headless Identity can do for you. And so you can actually inspect the code that we wrote. It'll be a Heroku app that'll be hosted and you'll be able to just plug in the credentials for your org. Don't worry, it doesn't save anything to the server. It'll entirely save in your browser's local storage. So super easy for you to test out all of these features. And finally, we also really spent a lot of time on that help documentation. That help documentation is opinionated. It tells you what to do in a public scenario, in a private scenario. It tells you how to implement recaptcha, which is part of the public implementation. So we've actually built recaptcha into this entire process. You'll notice maybe when you were looking at that website, 
there was a Recaptcha logo in the bottom corner. We were using Recaptcha v3 to initialize all of those requests to prevent spamming and bot attacks. All of that comes for free with this feature, and there's also an authenticated version. So if you're using an API gateway or have to operate in mainland China, there's another path for you as well. And I'm sure maybe someone's going, hey, you chose two Astro and Cody pictures. I like this QR code, but what is the third Astro and Cody? Um, well, I didn't disappoint. It is worker Astro and Cody. We're very excited about that. And that's the end of our talk, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time with us.